I'm Amy Gates, and welcome. Uh, it's always such a great pleasure to be here. And on behalf of Lee Morgan, who's the former COO of the Gates Foundation and myself, we both serve as trustees of the Cambridge, Gates Cambridge Trust, and we're really delighted to see all of you. I think we've talked about doing this program for a long time, and so it's really great. When we realized that the 2018 Gates Cambridge Scholar candidates were going to be interviewed here as a site for uh, the American candidates' interviews, it provided a really excellent opportunity to organize this program because we have Professor Barry Everett here, who is the director of the program, and there also are a good number of alums who live in this area. So, uh, give you a little bit of background about the program. Um, the program actually started in 2000 when Cambridge sent some people to talk to Bill Sr. about the idea of having Bill and Melinda fund Gates Scholars at Cambridge, sort of comparable, indeed better than, the Rhodes Scholars at Oxford. Right, Barry? <laughs> So that was the start of it, and for more than a decade, Bill Sr. was a trustee. And uh, it's very close to his heart, it's very close to my heart, and it really is, should be a source of pride for everybody at the foundation. It's really worth knowing about, because this is really an exemplary program. So not only does the program advance knowledge, and support scholarship, but it develops leaders who are committed to improving the lives of others. So it also embodies the values of the foundation and of the family, and we're very proud of that. Now, I want you to learn about the program from the people who have lived it and who indeed live it every day. So I'm gonna turn the mic over to Professor Barry Everett and let me, let me say just a few words about him. Uh, Barry is the provost of the Gates Cambridge Trust, a professor of behavioral neuroscience and director of research at Cambridge, and a former master of Downing College, Cambridge. His research, and I have to read this, is concerned with neural and psychological basis of learning, memory, and motivation, especially in the context of the mechanisms underlying drug addiction. And he has an immense number of publications, over 450, and he's one of the most respected neuroscience researchers in the world. He was appointed provost of the Gates Cambridge Trust in 2013, and he really does a superb job overseeing these outstanding graduate students at Cambridge, and promoting alumni engagement. But I think what really distinguishes Barry is he takes a personal interest in mentoring all of the Gates scholars. So Barry, let me turn it over to you. Give him a warm welcome. I think if I go up here, then you can all laugh when I fall off. It's, uh, so thank you, Mimi, for that introduction and it's a pleasure to be here and it's a pleasure to see so many people here. So I'm, I'm going to begin by just giving a kind of a top-down overview of, of the program and then we have uh, three Gates Scholar alumni here who are going to join me up here and I'm going to seed a few questions with them to reveal some aspects from their perspective of what it's like being a scholar and then throw it open to you and, and no questions are off limit. So I want to begin by saying, and in thanking Mimi and Lee for their energy in, in bringing this, this event to fruition, I think Bill and Melinda Gates, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation did an amazing thing back in 2000 in making a still unprecedented gift of $210 million to the University of Cambridge to found uh, 
an international postgraduate scholarship program. There was nothing like it in Cambridge in f uh, before. It's a unique program in the UK, and, and I, I will in include that uniqueness when comparing us to example for the, for the Rhodes Scholarship, which is, as Mimi said, not as good, but, <laughs> but also organized in, in a quite different way. Bill Senior, and, and I'm really delighted to see Bill Senior here, was massively involved in the uh, development of, of this program in Cambridge and was a founding trustee and stayed on the trustee board for the first nine years of its existence, seeing it into, uh, into adolescence, at least. Scholars are admitted to read uh, any degree that's offered by the University of Cambridge, PhDs, MPhils, and some other master's programs like the LLM or MBA. And we aim more or less to admit about 25% each of students in biomedical sciences, physical sciences, social sciences and humanities, and, and the arts. About 35% uh, of the scholars come from the US, and 65% come from the rest of the world, meaning everywhere in the world, except the UK, because this is an international program, uh, UK students can get their own funds. From the, from the outset, the program's objectives required Gates scholars to show three key characteristics. The first and most important is outstanding intellectual ability and achievement in their, in their college days and with prospects of that in the future. The second, very much consonant with the, the mission of the foundation, a commitment to improving the lives of others, however that's conceived. And thirdly, the potential for leadership in the domain in which they will, they will move in the future. And to gain admission to the scheme, all applicants are, they apply to Cambridge uh, for, for graduate studies, and they're first selected and ranked by the academic department or institute to which uh, they apply. And that's where the, the first and key selection takes place, making sure that scholars who are coming are coming to do something that can actually be handled and supervised and, and, and monitored at Cambridge. Uh, and it's where the academic quality is first assessed. That long list of several hundred applicants that, that arises from that process is then given to our own Gates shortlisters, who then shortlist that group of, of high achieving students into an interview shortlist um, in, in, a, in a process that really sees uh, many people uh, pass by. And we're here, as Mimi said, for the third time in, in, since 2013, interviewing the US candidates for their scholarships here in these rooms uh, in, in the foundation. We interview about 100 applicants from the US each year and about 130 from the rest of the world. That's Europe, South America, Asia, Australia, China, India, and so on. And the aim is to have about 65% PhDs and 35% MPhils. The Gates Scholar Community in Residence in Cambridge, actually current students, was set down in the trust deed to, to be around 225, so there was some idea of a Gates Scholar Community in Cambridge. So given that we admit about 90 to 95 each year, with some leaving at the end of one year because they've done MPhils, that's how we have about 220 to 240 in residence at any one time. Their studies in Cambridge are fully funded, fees, maintenance. And to give you an example for, this, for the, the regular three-year Cambridge PhD, that, that package of fees, maintenance, travel, visa costs, and some support for academic activities is worth about $150,000 to $200,000 per person for the time that they're in Cambridge. So it, it's a really superb scheme. It's a highly competitive program. Last year, we had over 6,000 applications uh, for the scheme, about eight or 900 from the US and 5,000 or so from the rest of the world. And there are many more who are qualified than we can possibly admit. So you can imagine the, the selection process is A, challenging, and B, actually sometimes quite tough. We'll go through that process here 
over the next couple of days. The scholars, when they come to Cambridge, join three communities. First and foremost, they're in their departments or institutes where they'll carry out research or undertake their MPhil studies. Because Cambridge is a collegiate university, they also become members of a college, like the one I headed uh, up until a few years ago. And that forms the, the, their core social environment and where they live. And then, as many Gates scholars will say, the most important thing is their Gates Scholar community. And we have a, a space in central Cambridge called the Gates Scholars Room that people come to uh, for uh, social activities. It's where the community gels but also they have talks and seminars and workshops and where many of their collaborative ventures uh, actually begin to, to, to form, or evolving often into, into projects that carry on long after they've, they've graduated. If I can have that next slide, there's a, a growing and vibrant uh, community of some 1,400 alumni now. The program, the first intake was 2001. We're nudging our way to our 20th anniversary. And that alumni community, of course, is, is scattered worldwide. And over this last period, uh, I and the, and the trust staff have, in, have been investing a great deal in trying to facilitate the development out of our alumni community. It's quite a challenge because although they're, they're a critical mass in a few places in the States, the others are scattered uh, far and wide. And there's a, an alumni-led alumni association that we work quite closely with, and we're having an increasing number of alumni events around the world, probably four or five this year, running into the early part of next. Now, even though it's a young program, the accomplishments of Gates Scholars, I think, are, are really remarkable, and many of them are already having a clear impact. I've just got half a dozen um, examples of the kinds of, of things that our scholars have gone on to do, often beginning that work in Cambridge. I could easily show about 20 <coughs> slides like this. Now, I realize perhaps I should have mentioned uh, Kayla Barron, who was in the media you probably saw in this last year, who's been selected for the 2017 class of NASA astronaut. So they're quite remarkable levels of, of achievement. Now, that's all I'm going to, to tell you. I'm going to leave you to ask questions. But I'm now going to ask our three alumni. There they are. Uh, to, to come and join me on the stage. Can we have the next slide? And this is Tara Cookson and Annalyn Conklin and Andrew Roberts. And I'm not going to introduce them in detail, but their summary bios are here. But Andrew was in the first year of intake of Gates Scholars in 2001, so he's the grand old man of the alumni community. Annalyn and, and Tara uh, are, are, are more recent, and they've done a very different courses whilst they've been in Cambridge. So I'm going to kick off by asking each of them a question or two just to get us going, and then it, it's all yours. And, and I think I'll, I'll begin with Andrew because um, you were there at the beginning, Andrew. When, when you arrived in Cambridge as the first intake of Gates Scholars, there wasn't a community to join, so there, were just, there was just the first intake. And yet, there was um, great emphasis placed on you as incoming, the incoming year of scholars to somehow form a scholar community and make it work to, to do things that were, were over and above just coming to study. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about yeah. how that happened. Yeah, thanks, thanks. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks, this is something that I've been involved with for um, you know, about 17 years since it first started and it's something which I, I'm really proud of how it's matured. So to the question, I think community, just to, I really want to underscore this. Community, I think, is one of the defining aspects of the scholarship. And, you know, if you go all the way back to 2001, just to paint a picture, right? You know, I, I heard about this. I, you know, obviously, the Gates name is, is one that had a, a large reputation, but we didn't really know much about it. There was this, this tagline that we're supposed to be um, developing a global network of future leaders to improve the lives of others. But if you actually ask somebody what that meant, it could mean a lot of different things. So I, I, I was lucky enough to get it, and I didn't know what to expect. I, I showed up at Heathrow Airport. My mom said, well, look for the limo with your name on it, but there was, there was no limo. Um, I, I was expecting to get like an apartment overlooking the river, but I ended up actually living under the stairs, quite literally, in this small cottage off of Wentworth um, Avenue. And, and like all these, all, y y there, there wasn't, 
any there there yet. It was it was brand new. Um, you have your colleges, like Barry said, and, and we had um, other things like our, our departments. I was in genetics, and um, I played sports, so I had that as well. But then, you know, some of the scholars, we run into each other from time to time. Oh, you're a Gates, so oh, I'm a Gates too. Let's go grab a beer. And we started doing this a bit. And we started realizing that, you know, there's actually another opportunity to even further augment the experience at Cambridge. So, uh, you, you know, um, when we did the math, there were some 30 or 30 to 40 countries represented. I was a fish out of water. I'd never met anybody from Iraq before. I never met anybody from some of these Southeast Asian countries. But here they all were with this common theme. Um, so we got together and we said, well, let's see if we can actually build something so that we can have some level of continuity with the scholarship for the people at Cambridge and beyond. And I think we've done that. Um, we had this one survey um, that we, uh, we instituted about how many Gates scholars would you recognize on the street. And before we started this, um, this initiative, there's, the average number was two or three. Then it went up to um, about 35 by the end of the second year. Um, we had an orientation, which, you know, honestly was one of the stupidest things we've ever done at the time, but it worked out, thank God, where people flying in, literally 18-hour flights, and we said, okay, great, welcome, now get on this bus, you're going to drive you six hours up north, um, hope it doesn't rain, and you're going to get to know everybody. And, and that really worked, and this is an orientation that's actually been um, going on since then. And the, the main point here, and I'll, I'll finish up, is we kind of recognized that we were at the early stages. And what the community has managed to do is develop a platform so that for the later classes, they don't have to start from scratch anymore. They could build upon it. And I think they've done a great job. We're really, really proud of what's actually happened here. Um, we have now, we, and then when you actually see them go past that, I mean, it's great to see that an astronaut in this program actually puts Gates Cambridge on their bio for everybody to see. And same for SCOTUS clerks, same for um, people that are running labs. It's, it's, really, it's really been something to be proud of to, to watch it grow. Thanks, Andy. Um, Tara, I'm going to pick on you next. So Cambridge obviously offers a world-class academic educational training environment, but how does the, the scholar program provide added value to that? Does it need to do any more? Well, I think that, as you were saying earlier, that there are sort of three um, criteria upon which Gates scholars are, are selected. So you have academic excellence, but then the commitment to improving the lives of others and leadership potential. And I think what the scholarship actually offers are opportunities to develop the leadership potential um, into concrete skills that then allow you to have that impact in whichever way you are choosing to um, improve others' lives. Um, and one of the ways the scholarship does this is through the Learning for Purpose program. And this was a program that um, is scholar initiated, like um, Well, it was initiated by you, actually. Yes, Modesty prevents. But in, uh, um, and how it came about was um, a handful of conversations over a beer in a pub um, among a few of us about five years ago. And I had just returned from a year of uh, ethnographic fieldwork in Peru. And I was a, a PhD uh, scholar. And I knew that I didn't want to stay in academia, but I didn't know how to take this very rigorous research training that I had received and make it applicable in something more industry focused in international development, which is my field. And having conversations with other scholars, they were feeling the same way, whether they were in the humanities or in the hard sciences. And so we started thinking about what are the skills that we actually need to build and sought support from the trust and started piloting programming. And we learned about negotiation from an ex-Scotland Yard hostage negotiator. We brought in the speaker trainer coach for um, TED Talks and learned how to deliver a TED Talk. Um, we brought in the op-ed project from New York, which is an, uh, an award-winning social enterprise that helps especially women have a voice in the media. And more and more scholars got on board and we started seeing people publish pieces and speak more openly, more women grabbing the microphone in the community. Um, and, I can, and so now this is actually an, an established pillar of, of the program. Um, 
it's entering its fifth year. And I can say for myself that I've drawn on a lot of those skills to now go and do uh, research work for UN Women and publish those findings in a way that doesn't just add to the academic conversation, but that has a policy influence or that you can put out in the newspaper and get public discussion starting. And I know <coughs> Rhodes certainly doesn't do that. Um, and as someone educated in Canada, um, scholarships in my previous degrees didn't do that either. So I think it is something that's a real value add. Thanks, Tara. And that, Anna Lynn. So Anna Lynn, I should say, has suffered flight cancellations and come down specially from Vancouver this morning to join us. So we're really grateful. Thank you for having um, me. So when you reflect on your time at, at Cambridge as a scholar now, just as a scholar experience kind of question, how has this time, do you think, influenced you personally and professionally afterwards? Yeah, so uh, professionally, I think my time as a scholar was um, very invigorating. It was sort of the first time I was able to establish myself as an independent researcher. And so my self-confidence in that regard absolutely skyrocketed. I had the ability to design my own studies, conduct the research and the data analysis, write it up, drive that whole process, and without limitations. So anytime I needed my mentors, they were there for me. But I went and knocked on their door and made sure that I got the resources that I need. If I needed to have movement on a manuscript that was sitting on my supervisor's desk, I'd, you know, kind of, hi, how you doing? <laughs> Remember that manuscript? We want to submit that next week, you know, that kind of thing. So um, it just allowed me to really become an independent researcher and really feel that for the first time, having already come from being a consultant researcher where I had a policy, health policy research background, you, that's quite different. You don't have necessarily your own scope to define the research question and really see that through. And that, that's quite unique. So professionally, that, that was amazing as a scholar. Personally, it was, it was, it was life affirming to, to be a Gates scholar, to be able to um, meet all the incredible other scholars from around the world that are all joined by this by these three criteria, not just that you know we excel academically, a lot of people excel academically and that's how they get their awards, but we have the leadership potential and we all have the commitment and desire to change lives. So it just being in a room full of other like-minded people is, is amazing and, and, and really enriching. And I was able to engage my future mother-in-law on, on really special things like going to Evensong to my, at, at Trinity Hall, that's where I was at a college. And she sings in a choir, so for her to be at one of the most original, oldest and smallest uh, chapels, I think in all of Cambridge, possibly even in all of UK, was incredible. And that was such a special moment. And so personally, that was extremely enriching. And it was an opportunity y you don't get anywhere else in the world. And um, I still miss the shared meals at, at Formal Hall. I have to say that was probably the cornerstone of my Cambridge experience. Yeah, those amazing conversations and, and just sharing with others your research informally and just having a shared meal in, in walls that have 800 years of history of people doing that. Yeah. So it's the first time I've heard anyone recommend Cambridge for its food, actually. So it's <laughs> <coughs> I was at Trinity Hall. So. <laughs> That's really good. I mean, I, we're going to open this up generally now, but I, another question has just um, occurred to me. I mean, Andy, you're from the US, from Canada. You've got plenty of world-class universities. It would have been easy for you to gain entrance into highly competitive graduate programs without traveling to a 850-year-old university that's, that's had a very long time to become really quite cranky and obscure. Um, what, what made you think that you would step out of the comfort zone to, to do that? So I, I remember this so explicitly. So I was at UCSD, and, and I, I loved San Diego. I think if you guys have been there, you've like the sunsets are gorgeous. We have Black's Beach, and you know, I was I was your California surfer guy, and I was okay with that. Um, so I got into you know my I was doing some research there, and my supervisor asked me to stay on for a PhD. And I was thinking, you know, if I don't leave now, I'm never gonna leave. And and as a control, my sister was there as well, and she still hasn't left. So I, I kind of feel like 
<laughs> so I, I chose the most different English speaking school that I could find and, and Cambridge was the one that, and it, they did great research. It just checked all the boxes right down the, down the row. Um, and then, you know, you, you're looking at this through a website and you just see pictures of, it's, it's like Harry Potter, it really is. I mean, you have, you got like these candles on the wall and they're all dressed up and there's some sort of like magical, you know, owls dropping letters and, um, so, and I was like, you know, I wanna be part of that. And, and it was really inclusive. So going over there, it was, it, it, there's a romance to it. And, and I really appreciate it. There's, there's so much history. Um, geez, I mean, Dar where Darwin lived is just a random house that I think students are still living in today. And yet, you know, my, my wife went to UVA and Edgar Allan Poe like lived in one room for three months and it's walled off and it's like tourist lines around the corner. And I just, I just love like the history. You can't, you can't walk five steps without tripping over history there and it's fantastic. So no, that was my story. Adeline? For me, I was, I was already in Cambridge, so I was working for RAND Europe, and um, that allowed me to develop a relationship with um, one of the world's leaders in diabetes research, so Nicholas Wareham, Professor Wareham. Mm. And I, it, it just was a natural next step for me. I mean, I guess I'd always envisioned, um, I'm from an academic family, so that sort of the PhD was sort of always on the table. And having the opportunity to apply for Gates Cambridge to have a fully funded um, degree was was incredible. I think for me it was just the circumstance and the timing. I was already there. I'd already had um, two degrees from other countries as well, so I, I sort of come from that background of going to many different institutions. So I'd been to Edinburgh and I'd been to the Mailman School of Public Health at Columbia University. So the international context was sort of um, natural. just natural mm. for me. Tara. Um, well, I think it was, I'm the first person in my family to go to university. I come from a very um, working class family um, in a small part of Canada. And showing up in Cambridge and having, as Annalyn was saying, sort of these dinners with people who are doing all of these amazing things, come from all over the world. I mean, the, the scholarship is incredibly diverse. Um, and getting to learn from and also be mentored by and inspired by your peers was incredible. Um, and it's continued to be a rich resource um, as an alumna. Um, since leaving Cambridge, I um, started my own company and I consistently go back to my peers, um, some of whom were on the, the slide before this, to ask for help. How do you hire someone? I need to perfect my elevator pitch. Um, I need a mentor in this particular thing. And I, and I constantly can go back and draw on that resource. And as other new scholars come in, can act as a resource for them too. Um, and I think that that's something that, to have access to that is really, I mean, it, it's unparalleled, really. Okay, thank you very much. Right, over to you. Any questions to any of us? Yeah. We, uh, we have a microphone back here, so if you'd like to, um, that I can't reach. So <laughs> <laughs> this place is very sizest. Um, <laughs> so we, uh, thank you for coming today. We have a full room of people here. We also have over 35 people joining us remotely via oh. Skype. So I'm asking a question on behalf of one of our colleagues, Janet White, who serves on our pneumonia team. And she says, thank you for educating us about this wonderful program, but she's biased. She says she's a Cambridge alum from 1984, and her question is, how can I help and get involved? That's an interesting, that's an interesting question. Does she want to come back and do another degree? <laughs> well, I can answer that thing as I'm her boss, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, I think there, there is ample opportunity to become involved with alumni group, where, you know, wherever she is, alumni groups uh, who are looking to learn from people who are further on in their careers and have different kinds of experiences. There's plenty of opportunity there. There is, of course, publicizing this scheme and bringing, bringing it to the awareness of, of young college students and getting them into the mode of thinking it is quite exciting 
to leave what's familiar and go abroad to study, and that there is a program that's, that's looking for, for people with talent. And, that's, uh, and, and someone who's had experience of Cambridge and who can explain the Cambridge context, because it is a strange place. It's an outlier, really. I mean, Oxford's an outlier, too. This collegiate university system is strange and, and quite complex. So there's a great deal that she could do uh, there in, in explaining you know, how that works and why it's, why it's exciting. <laughs> no favoritism, though. So my name's Keith Klugman. I head up the pneumonia program here at the foundation. And uh, I was forced over the summer to spend a week in Cambridge with one of our grantees and had to have tea at Grantchester and walk to Cambridge. It was, and it is gorgeous. But I have a kind of a serious question for you guys. So, and it's about your selection process. So this is an extraordinary opportunity for anybody around the world. Um, and I see the U.S. bias, which I think is not unreasonable, given where the money has come from. Um, but clearly, it's not a level playing field for the people who apply to this. There are individuals who will have come from outstanding academic backgrounds. Um, and then there are those who will come from uh, backgrounds, particularly, I would imagine, in South Asia and Africa, which would be far less easy to show their worth. And I just wondered how you deal with this. Do you have some kind of geographic grouping or do you simply say well the rest of the world compete against each other we take the best of the best and if they all come from Canada and Western Europe well that's the way it is I think I better feel that and it's a really pertinent question um, the, the first thing I'll say is is that again let, let's compare ourselves with Rhodes immediately they have a quota system you know so there's always one student from Pakistan you know and, and one from the Bahamas or something like that. We don't do that. It's, it's open. And so the, the application in that sense is, is blind to country of origin. It's about whether a person with the ability to do so can be matched with a course or a, or, or a PhD research topic that, that they're fit for. And there is a, a lot more, let me call it, noise in the rest of the world application system because, as you rightly say, there's a tremendous difference in the levels of, of tertiary education achieved and it's tough to come and do a master's or a PhD in a university in Cambridge so there has to be a you know a requirement which of course applicants from the US meet very easily and you're right the the fact that there there is a disproportionate given the number of applicants disproportionate number of, of people coming from the US but the quality of course is exceptional and I mean we we, we have a hundred uh, candidates on the books in the next couple of days, and I think the average GPA is four. I mean, and I never understood the American system where you can get a, a, a mean GPA that's 4.4 out of four, but that's your problem, <laughs> not, not mine. But, but, there, but there is a challenge there, uh, and it's something that's, that we talk about a lot in, in, in the trust and with the trustees, that over the last few years it's become clear that about 80% of the applicants from the US want only to come to, to, to read for MPhils. And in the biomedical sciences where I do the interviewing, almost all of them are, have already got sorted out an MBPhD program back in the US. So what I worry about there is not that, of course, it isn't useful to come to Cambridge for a year to do an MPhil, but it's not a life-changing event the way it is if you come there for longer and do something more substantial. And that there is clearly a perception, and we've got this from our surveys, surveys, that somehow a PhD from Cambridge, because it's shorter, is a little less valuable if you're going to tread the boards in a US academic environment you know, in the future or indeed in the medical environment. And I don't think that's true, but I understand the concern. So we're putting a lot of effort now into encouraging more of that US contingent to come uh, to Cambridge to do more substantive degrees. And I think the, if, if the, the pattern stays as it is now, we will, we will move the proportions. And the, and the proportion was actually never laid down in the trust deed. It was set out in one of the early meetings of the trustees that that will be desirable because actually it's a bit like Rhodes does. And I think we've probably matured enough now to, to sort out our own, our own proportionality. So I 
guess I'll ask a follow-up question um, in the same kind of sense. I was happy to hear, Tara, that you came from a working class family. Um, how do you use income as a uh, criteria? Because obviously, it's not just globally that the that this um, playing field is not even, but it's also uneven within countries. So how are you using that when you have such a, a large tier, but if they're all more or less the same, same socioeconomic background, et cetera, how are you using that to help um, really create opportunities for kids who otherwise wouldn't be taking advantage? Do you want to address that? You might be able to speak more in terms mm -hmm. of like institutionally. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we, we don't try to fractionate people out according to their socioeconomic class. Really, the criterion is academic attainment that qualifies for admission to the university. So we can't admit anyone who hasn't reached those criteria. And of course, that's the challenge, because in some countries, that's almost unattainable. But we don't just have scholars coming from elite universities. So that's true in the States. You might think it's an, an Ivy League enclave, but it's not. I, Jim is here, and I'm trying to think back to our stats book. It's about 180 US universities? 200 U US universities. So students aren't coming to Cambridge only from that that privileged end. But we have scholars from all over Africa, from Afghanistan, from Pakistan, from India, from Sri Lanka. So there's, there's a, a real mix of backgrounds and, and, and experiences that, that come. It's a very, very heterogeneous group. They haven't all been to uh, your privileged academic environments in order to get here. I, <clears throat> let me clarify just a little bit because, again, if you were to take the US system, obviously it's not just academic criteria because once you've gotten a good pool, who can do the work? I'm asking, how are you considering those other aspects? Because someone who's coming from a much more challenging environment um, who makes it into an academic um, program at Cambridge, for example, that's, that's a different life skill set that they're bringing to someone who maybe both of their parents were doctors and they yeah. grew up traveling the world. So I'm asking, how are you taking those life experiences that are socioeconomic into consideration? It's, it's embodied in their applications. We ask, we ask them to write about that. And the reason we interview is we talk to them about that. And, and that's what, what produces, I think, the heterogeneity in the, in the group that actually comes. I mean, you've been there as scholars. Would you say I'm correct when I say there's heterogeneity in the, in the group? Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry, what was your name? Uh, Tandy Onami. I'm a, a program officer on the HIV vaccine team. OK, thank you. I, I totally get your question now. And I think it actually is a really important one. And I think it's one of the ways as well that um, the Gates scholarship is sort of like, it adds on to the Cambridge experience. I remember getting there for my very first dinner and having to sit down and there were like a million forks. And I know that's very stereotypical, but I was like, what the hell am I gonna do with all these forks? <laughs> and the interesting thing about the, on the one hand, the collegiate system at the university, so you, you, you get accepted to Cambridge and you get assigned to a college. And at your college is where um, you eat your meals, you probably sleep there, you have your extracurricular activities, um, you have a tutor who's basically a welfare resource for you. If you're having you know, um, mental health stresses or a family problem or financial difficulty, you have someone that you know you can email them at any time of the day and they're there for you. And I think that helps buffer some of the, um, some of the challenges that come with coming into a new environment that is a very prestigious environment, like there's no two ways about it, and helping you sort of navigate that. And then in the Gates community itself, I can imagine that like as Andy was saying, you know, before when you, you didn't really know anybody else, you didn't 
know the other sort of foreign students at the university, then being able to sort of go to other people who are experiencing the same things as you. Um, and that's reflected in the programming, like the Learning for Purpose um, Leadership Program that I mentioned earlier. We actually did like a, a, a series of brain trusts, of brainstorming sessions, where we made sure that we had um, gender um, and geographical representation throughout the scholarship so that we could come to a definition of leadership that wasn't totally US centric or that wasn't totally from an Ivy League um, perspective or something like that. So there are these opportunities and because the scholarship does have a, 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 a good diverse range of people that come, those, those voices are all, um, those voices are, are integrated into the programming. I don't know if that helps answer a little bit more. Can I add to that? I think uh, just touching on what Professor uh, said, there, you write a personal statement that that's the unique piece of document that um, is part of your, your application for the Gates Scholarship. That's not something that is part of the Cambridge application. You have to write a personal statement in addition to that. You also have to have an extra letter of reference from someone else other than your two main academic references. And that person is supposed to um, speak to your, your leadership capability and your commitment to changing the lives of others. So I think it's in that personal statement that these individual stories of challenge, of struggle, yet achieving a very high level, I think I would imagine that that is that that's sort of how those social factors are, are considered in a, in a sort of qualitative way. I don't imagine that it's quantified and ranked and people, you know, number them, but, uh, you know, that's, that's qualitative, rich text that, that is used, I would imagine. And you have to write that in 500 words. It's, it's about what you've achieved, why you, what motivates you um, to do what you do and things like that. And, I hear what you're saying that in some ways by definition you are picking from a fairly privileged group of people by definition because to have achieved a high level of tertiary education is it's a privilege in many countries um, except for those that fund it fully like Norway and whatnot but I hear what you're saying but I, I would envision that that personal statement is is the defining piece that brings those factors in. I, um, I think someone ought to lower the microphone, you know? Okay, should. <laughs> okay I think we're good. So, uh, good afternoon. My name is Shimona. I'm a fellow here in the Global Health team, and I had the privilege of coming through the Rhodes Scholarship uh, on the DPhil. <laughs> so, the it's other great place. to hear uh, about this program. I actually met a number of Gates Scholars during my time at Oxford as we try to interact uh, and sort of merge the Rhodes and Gates Scholar community. You know, it's a fantastic bunch of people. Um, and you know we've been enriched by knowing uh, Gates scholars, definitely. Um, so I had a question about the model. Uh, and it's sort of a follow-up to Keith's question. I guess uh, in the Rhodes Scholarship, we obviously you know, select from geographic, yeah, you sort of have geographic pools. Um, and in, by relying on the, uh, the university to select um, the first sort of batch from which you then choose, especially Oxford and Cambridge have gone under much scrutiny during the time that I was there for sort of having a bias in selection. So I just wondered what you thought about the model in the Cambridge selection first and then selecting from that pool versus the Rhodes Scholarship um, that's sort of thinking a bit more globally in focus. Um, because to be quite frank, uh, the Rhodes Scholars at Oxford represented much of the diversity, if I contributed much of the diversity at Oxford because of the way that the selection process uh, happened. So I just wondered your thoughts on the model and do you think that it might change? I think Oxford will change, actually, because the, if you think about it, it's, it's an admission system to the Rhodes that um, takes academic selection by the people who are responsible for supervising and teaching out of their hands completely. So, so the Rhodes uh, scholarship teams who are scattered all over the world, they interview all over the world as you know, admit people according to, to Rhodes criteria to come to Oxford and then they do that in December and then uh, 
there, there's a frenzy of activity in January for those scholars to be actually placed in, in departments to do their, their PhDs. And I know this has caused the admission system and graduate education in Oxford quite a challenge because when admissions are, are a bit under the microscope, it, it's, it doesn't seem as if it's based on the criteria that students are normally admitted for. So when this uh, scheme was set up in Cambridge, it was always assumed at the outset that it wouldn't try, and, wouldn't try to second guess the standards required of the people coming to then join research labs and undertake PhD research and, and, and undertake M MPhils. So it's much more in line, for example, with, with undergraduate admissions, where the academic attainment is, is, is matched to the kinds of courses that people will have to, to undertake when they're there. So it's actually a much more um, rational system so far as admission into a university is concerned. Of course, Rhodes is populated by supremely talented scholars. It's not as, it's not as if there's a shortage, but, and it's only recently, in fact, that Rhodes scholars were, for example, admitted from the outset to PhDs. The, 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 the general idea was to, to have Rhodes scholars there for at least two years, which ruled out PhDs and often resulted in scholars doing not one but two masters back to back because there were very few two-year courses. So they've just had a fund fundamentally different origin. Of course, Rhodes is much older. It's over a, over a century old. Uh, they're, they're different. They both bring in highly talented people from around the world, but the, the, the structure on which they're, they're based is, is, is really, really radically different. And I, and, I, and I think the changes that are happening at Rhodes now are an increasing alignment with the academic standards mechanisms that are required for admission into the university. Can I, can I also say, too, I mean, to your point about the diversity of the scholarship, um, I, I think, the, you know, I don't think that the, the way that Gates is actually set up, I think it's actually really encouraged it. You know, in, in only like 15 years, we have some like what is it, Jim, 100 countries represented, like very close to that. Um, by definition, uh, you know, more like 60% are outside of the US. And um, the community itself has managed to actually facilitate that. So maybe it's not as engineered, right, as and it's a little bit more organic. But uh, I, I, I fully believe that it's, it was a very um, eye-opening experience. I think I got a lot of exposure to cultures that I would not have had otherwise. And um, so I don't think there was that much of a, the diversity didn't necessarily suffer just because it was, it was this scheme versus the road scheme, if that makes sense. And there's also been efforts to, um, to generate a, a greater number of applications coming from outside of North America. So efforts um, to go through Sub-Saharan Africa Russian and through Africa. Um, Latin America. Yeah. Um, so that the applicant pool gets bigger as well, so that more people, I mean, being such a, a, a newer scholarship in comparison to Rhodes, to actually do that work to get the word out, I think, as well. I've been given a red light here, so there's, there's, there's time for one more question. That usually stops it being asked, actually. <laughs> okay, just, oh, okay, just yell. Um, <laughs> He's a recipient. Oh, um, so the question was, what is the Bill Gates Senior Prize? Um, it was a prize um, founded in honor of um, Bill Gates Sr.'s contribution to the scholarship. As he, step, as he stepped down from being a trustee yes. after nine years. Yes. Um, and it's a peer-nominated prize that's in the end decided by um, the trust um, for someone who's... Um, shown, uh, gone above and beyond in meeting the criteria of the scholarship, particularly around the um, commitment to improving the lives of others and showing leadership. Um, and so I was nominated for um, the work around learning for purpose and building out a leadership program um, that was um, inclusive of the community and um, I guess had a little bit of staying power. <laughs> what better than to have a, a winner tell you why they won it? No. <laughs>
And there's been a, a bunch of other really remarkable of scholars have. that have won it for other have. reasons as well, for things in their research and, and et cetera. Okay, that's it. Can I thank you all for coming very much?